Good morning, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Bishan Jasselan. He is currently a junior Simons professor at IMPAN, where he delivers a brilliant series of lectures on classification, on applications of classification of sister algebras. He still has one more week to go, so I strongly recommend that you sign up and attend it on Zoom, unless you want to come in person, of course. But before I let him speak today, uh, let me tell you a little bit about his history. So Bishan is originally from Trinidad and Tobago. I have to admit, I had to look it up where exactly it was, but here it is, you see, on the global map. But then uh, he did his uh, bachelor in Cambridge, Cambridge, England, not Massachusetts. Uh, then he did his PhD in Scotland. I know who was your supervisor? Simon Vass. Simon Wasserman, yes. And uh, he became Canadian by being a postdoc uh, in Toronto in the Fields Institute of George Eliot, who is the father of classification program. And introduced even more geographical diversity to his life. He is now working in Prague in the Institute of Mathematics of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Okay, and that's, I think, enough for the introduction. And today we are going to learn about the Drunkard's uh, UHF algebras. I have only one concern. Shall we be able to follow your talk while being sober? Is it okay? Okay. Either sure. way. The floor is yours. Take it away. Uh, thanks a lot. And thank you to the organizers for uh, giving me the chance to tell you about these Drunkard's UHF algebras, whatever they are. Um, I mean, I'll tell you what they are. Uh, so I will describe to you, first of all, what a uh, ah, right. hmm. Why does it, how do I get this to highlight? Um, yeah, how do I? Ah, <laughs> okay, I was writing with the, the wrong side of the pen there. All right, so moving along. So a, a UHF algebra is a, is a kind of object that um, has already been described a couple of times this week, uh, but I, I will start from the beginning. And then uh, the, the drunken bit is I'll tell you how to randomly construct these UHF algebras. That's what that means. Uh, so let's get going. So the starting point, um, as we work our way up to the definition of a UHF algebra, is the Hilbert space. These have also been mentioned a couple of times, uh, but I will remind you. The Hilbert space is a vector space with an inner product. Um, by the way, when I say vector space today, it will always be a complex vector space. And inner product, again, just to remind you, it's a positive definite, a sesquilinear uh, linear form on H. So positive definite means this condition that um, the inner product of x with itself is bigger than or equal to zero with quality if and only if x is zero. Uh, it's linear in the second coordinate. I mean, you have to make a choice which one you want to make linear. I go with the second one. And it is um, anti-symmetric. So if we swap the order, we get the complex conjugate. So that's what an inner product is. And um, we want the norm associated to this inner product to, to be complete. We want Cauchy sequences with respect to this norm to converge. So the norm is the square root of x dot x uh, with itself. I think again, just to remind you what, what exactly a norm is. A norm is a way of measuring lengths in a vector space uh, with axioms uh, similar to the ones you have for inner products. So again, we want positive definite. The length of any vector should be bigger than equal to zero. The only thing with zero length should be the zero vector. If I scale a vector, then I scale the length with an absolute value, and I have this uh, triangle inequality. All right, so some examples of Hilbert spaces to bear in mind. First of all, uh, we take H to be the uh, a finite dimensional Hilbert space, C to the N, with its complex dot product, that you may know. Uh, an infinite dimensional version of this is another space which has been mentioned a couple of times this week. It's uh, L2 of N. So we take the space of complex sequences that are square summable. So the sum of the squares of the absolute values that is less than infinity. And with this uh, restriction, this inner product defined just like the dot product converges. It converges because of this condi condition and uh, because of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. 
All right. And by the way, so these examples uh, describe up to isomorphism every Hilbert space of dimension at most uh, countably infinite. Just keep these ones in mind. So it, just to, to, to summarize what kind of a structure Hilbert space is, it's a vector space in which we can do geometry, meaning we can, we can measure lengths by the norm and angles by the inner product. And we can also do analysis. We can make sense of convergent sequences and in particular, uh, convergent series. So to get to the definition of a, what these UHF algebra gadgets, we need to go a level up and we're going to act on the Hilbert space by continuous linear operators. Uh, so a little exercise for you. A linear map from a Hilbert space to itself is continuous precisely when it is bounded in this sense. So there is some constant m such that the norm of px is at most time m times the norm of x for any vector x. If you take the smallest possible m that works for which this holds, that's what's called the operator norm. Uh, or equivalently, you can describe it like this. It, is, it measures how much the operator stretches the unit ball. You take all vectors x in the unit ball and you look at the supremum of the size of, uh, of px. So th this is what was described uh, yesterday in, in Anna's talk. Another little exercise is to show what I said is true, that if you take the smallest m, it, it can equally well be defined uh, this way. All right, so we will write B of H for the collection of all uh, bounded linear operators on H. So, you know, uh, just as an example, um, well, actually uh, um, a bunch of examples. So if H is finite dimensional, then, okay, very little exercise. In finite dimensions, every linear map is automatically bounded, automatically continuous. Uh, so in, in particular, if we take P to be, let's say a rotation, uh, this preserves length. So the, the norm of a rotation operator is just one. So the, the best possible bound that works is m equals one. Uh, so it, because of this, the bounded linear operators on Cn, it's the same as just the n by n matrices, um, mn, n by n matrices you mentioned in the, in the, in the complex numbers. All right, but um, this isomorphism here is a bit begging the question, uh, isomorphic in what sense? What is the, the category, in other words, uh, with which in which these objects are isomorphic? And, and this is the, the kind of structure that we have learned about a couple of times this week, uh, but let's again get to it gradually. So let's first of all examine what kind of an object is, is B of H in general? What kind of structure is it? Uh, first of all, it is a vector space. So we can take a linear combination, a vector space roughly is a step in which we can make sense of linear combinations. And we can make sense of a combination, a linear combination of continuous linear map. Any linear combination of continuous linear map is again, a continuous linear map. It is also an algebra. In addition to this linear structure, we have a product structure. So we can, the product is just composition of linear operators. We can multiply two linear operators in a sensible way, it's associative, uh, et cetera. Uh, it, it's also unital. I mean, there's a unital, uh, there's an identity linear operator, just the do nothing operator. And the, the linear structure is compatible with this product uh, in this way. So multiplication distributes over a linear combination. So it's a vector space, it's an algebra. It is in fact a star algebra. So in addition to this multiplication operator, we have an adjoint operator. So this involution uh, T maps to T star. The way the, the adjoint of a linear operator T is characterized is that we can, if we have an inner product Tx with y, we can move the T to the other side of the inner product by taking the adjoint. So Tx inner product with y is x inner product of T star y uh, for any vectors x and y. And the involution has these properties. The, the involution of an involution is, is, is T itself. The adjoint of a product, the product of the adjoints, swip, swatch, swip, swat, swap, switch. Uh, and the adjoint is uh, conjugate linear. So the adjoint of a, of a linear combination is the linear combination of the adjoints if we take the, the complex conjugates of these uh, coefficients. So that makes it into what's called a star algebra. And finally, and this is the object we've heard about a couple of times, it is in fact a C star algebra. So in addition to the algebra structure and this involution, we have a norm, namely the, the operator norm, which we just described. And the operator norm satisfies a couple of things. 
First of all, it has this sub multiplicatively property, which was described uh, by Otto in his talk on Monday. And that makes it makes B of H into what's called a Banach algebra, together with the fact that with respect to this norm, it is uh, uh, complete. Uh, by the way, um, the, the, I guess third little exercise, you, the completeness of B of H with respect to the operator norm, it follows from completeness of H, um, the completeness of the Hilbert space H. And crucially, most crucially um, about the, the compatibility with the norm, with the rest of the structure is this C star identity. So the norm of uh, T star T is equal to the norm of uh, T squared for any bounded linear operator T. So it is, as if this is the final time I'll be telling you about the next slide. So final little next. Maybe a quick remark. Yeah. So this completeness of B of H, B of H consists from maps from H to H. And what is important is that H uh, is in the codomain. Yes. So, so yes. The codomain is responsible for completeness. Yes. The general fact is if you have linear maps from something, a uh, norm space into a norm space that's complete, as, as Adam points out, completeness of the codomain that is important for this, for this little exercise. All right. Uh, and the, so the, the C star identity, it can be shown directly from the defining property of the adjoint, this fact that Tx inner product Y is X, you can bring it across to the other side. All right. So if you solve all of these little exercises, then uh, Thomas Weber will buy you a pair. All right, so um, B of H is a, is a C star algebra. The collection of n by n matrices, mn with, with complex entries, is also a C star algebra. Uh, so the, the linear structure, also all this again was described yesterday in Alan's talk. Um, the, the linear structure, we can take linear combinations of matrices. We know how to multiply matrices. The adjoint of a matrix is, is what you know it is from linear algebra. It's the transpose with the complex conjugate of the entries. And the, the, the norm we take on it is again, just the operator norm. We view the matrix as acting on CN as a linear operator just by matrix multiplication. And we take the operator norm of that linear operator. So with this structure, uh, we also get a C star algebra. Um, and by the way, so this map that I just described, sending a matrix to the associated linear map by matrix multiplication is what's called a star homomorphism, the meaning uh, it has this structure. So if we send, it, it, meaning it's a linear map, it is multiplicative, and it preserves the, the adjoint. So we have a star homomorphism from the n by n matrices to uh, B of C to the n. In fact, um, so a, a star homomorphism is the right notion of morphism in the category of C star algebra. So just to remind you, C star algebra it had a lot of structure, it's vector space and algebra, there's a star, also this norm, and here I'm just saying the properties of a star homomorphism. Uh, it respects this star algebraic structure. And you may say, well, okay, well, what about the norm? Shouldn't it be compatible with the norm in some way? That's automatic. The fact that I'm, I'm telling you, and I'm not setting it as an exercise, it's a little bit more involved, is that uh, any star homomorphism in this sense between two C star algebras, it's automatically contracted. So the norm of I of A is, is less than or equal to the norm of A. This automatically holds. And even more is true if it's in fact an injective star homomorphism, then uh, it, the norm is, uh, it's an isometric map. It actually preserves the norm on the node. So th this is kind of telling you that C star algebras have some very rigid structure. You get quite a lot for free just because of uh, things like the C star identity. Uh, so um, by the way, so this map from matrices to the associated linear map, it is by definition isometric. All right, because we defined the norm on MN as essentially the norm that comes from viewing it as a linear map. Uh, but in fact, it's also surjective. So it is what's in fact, what's called a star isomorphism. The inverse map is of course, we, we take a linear map and we take its matrix. So we know that every linear map can be represented by a matrix. With respect to some basis, let's decide that we're doing this isomorphism by looking at just the standard basis. All right, so we have a star homomorphism from MN to uh, B of CN and another star homomorphism the other way around and they are inverse to each other. So when I say that B of C to the N is isomorphic to uh, MN, what I mean is they are isomorphic as C star algebra. Okay, so let's now, C star algebras are now the, the basic object of in interest. A UHF algebra is going to be a certain kind of C star algebra. We're still not there yet, describing exactly what it is. 
But first, let's have some other examples of C-star algebras. Uh, firstly, you can take Dirac sum. The Dirac sum of C-star algebras is again a, a C-star algebra. Uh, in particular, if you just have a bunch of copies of different MNs and you take their Dirac sum, uh, the algebraic structure is you just do it component-wise. So if I have a, a tuple, uh, you know, I, I multiply two tuples together, uh, just uh, entry by entry. And uh, how do I perpetually struggle with how do you betray me this way? Ah, ah once again, I, I do this. All right, it's just the wrong side of the panel. All right. Okay, anyway, so we do the, the, the pointwise algebraic operation. And the norm you take is you just take the, the maximum of the, the C star norms in each of the components. All right, this is a C star algebra. In fact, it is a finite dimensional C star algebra, meaning it's finite dimensional as a vector space. And um, in, in the fact that I'm telling you is that every finite dimensional C star algebra is of this form. Finite dimensional, again, just as a vector space. Uh, okay, some more examples. Again, this was also mentioned uh, yesterday in Anna's talk. Uh, and I guess Arthur as well on, on, on Monday, if we have some compact Hausdorff topological space and we look at the collection of continuous functions from X to C with, uh, again, the, just the, the pointwise algebraic operations, we multiply two functions just by multiplying them pointwise, and we take this uniform norm. Uh, this is also a, a C-star algebra. It, it's complete, it, it satisfies the C-star identity and so on. And in fact, um, what uh, has been mentioned is that every unital commutative C star algebra is of this form. In fact, something stronger is true. We have this equivalence of categories. And this is why the theory of C star algebras uh, is, is often thought of as non commutative topology. Okay, uh, another example. Um, okay, so B of H is a C star algebra. Another thing we can do in general, if we have a C star algebra, we can take a sub algebra. And this will also give us a C-star algebra. Uh, Subalgebra meaning it should be closed under the, the linear structure, the multiplication structure, the star structure, and it should also be norm closed. And then once we have a norm closed subspace of a complete space, it's also complete. So any norm closed star subalgebra of C-star algebra is again a C-star algebra. And in fact, it's a very fundamental theorem in C-star algebra theory that absolutely every abstract C-star algebra described in this way with these, the structure is, does arise as a normed closed sub C-star algebra, sub algebra of uh, B of H for some H. So these two facts that I've, I've written in red here, these are often called the, the Gelfand Neymar theorems for C-star algebra. So let's have um, a particular instance of this sub algebra of B of H. Let's see what kind of C star algebra we can get. So let's fix as our H, this L2 of N. Remember this infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Let's take a standard, I should say really standard orthonormal basis here. Meaning, so we take this, remember this is the L2 of N is the space of square summable complex sequences. So EI is just the sequence with a one in position I, zeros everywhere else. So just like you would take the standard basis of CN, it's like this, except there are infinitely many of them. It's an orthonormal basis in the following sense. So first of all, they are, they are orthonormal. If I take the dot product, the, the inner product of two different ones, I get zero. The inner product with one with itself, I get one. So it has norm one. And any vector in H, it's not going to be a finite linear combination of these EIs, but an infinite sum. Remember, we can make sense of this. And the norm of X is just going to be by this L2 sum of these uh, uh, coefficients. All right, so with respect to this orthonormal basis, we can think of continuous linear operators as infinite matrices by looking at these matrix coefficients. So, so again, just like in finite dimensions, this T times EJ, this would be like picking out the Jth column of a matrix. And then when I take the inner product with the basis vector EI, this is like picking out the ith entry in the jth column. Okay, so this will specify the matrix for me. You have to be a bit careful here because uh, I'm saying we're thinking of these as infinite matrices, but not every infinite matrix is allowed. So for example, we can't have one column just consisting of one, 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 all the way down. Why? Because that would be like taking these x i's just to be all ones, but then this sum will not converge. So this one, 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 one will not even give us an element of the Hilbert space, all right? 
But even, even if we pay attention to that and say, okay, we just make sure all the columns do converge, that's still not enough. Because for example, I could take the diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. So in other words, the, I could look at the map send T that sends EN to N times EN. That's not bounded because the, we have these elements EN in the unit ball, they all have norm one, but they're getting mapped to bigger and bigger and bigger things. Okay, so we, oh, we can view them as infinite matrices, but not all infinite matrices are allowed. Uh, one kind of infinite matrix that definitely is allowed is the one that's just mostly zero. If we have all and all but finitely and many entries zero, that will give us something nice and well-defined bounded. So in particular, we could uh, look at this. So uh, by this, I mean, um, we have the top, the entries in the four entries in the upper left corner can be non-zero, can be anything. Everything else is zero. So this just gives us a copy of the two by two matrices sitting inside the upper left corner of B of H when we are thinking of elements of B of H as certain infinite matrices. We can make this a little bit bigger. So similarly, we can have M4 sitting again in the top left corner. And notice that inside this, and everything else is zero, and notice that inside this M4, we have the M2 that we were just looking at. So this is our copy of M2, where these entries are non-zero and everything else is zero. We can go a bit bigger. We look at M8. So these, are, these entries can be non-zero, everything else is zero. And we have sitting inside here our copy of M4 and sitting inside there our copy of M2. And we can repeat this procedure. So at each stage, we have M2 to the I sitting inside the upper left corner of M2 to the I plus one. Everything else is just being uh, zero. This is what I wrote there. Wrote there is just what I said. Um, if we take just the big union of this increasing sequence of subalgebras, we get a star subalgebra. That will again be a star subalgebra. It may not be uh, closed, so we take the closure. And when we take the closure of this increasing union of matrix algebras, we get what's called the, the compact operator. So this is an example of a, of a C star algebra, compact operator. Um, it's, it's a very important example in, in C star algebra theory. Uh, one thing to note, though, about this compact operators is that whenever we view one of these m2 to the i's sitting inside m2 to the i plus one, it's a non unital equation uh, inclusion. So the two by two identity matrix does not get sent to the four by four identity matrix, it gets sent to one, one, zero, zero. So we have a bunch of non unital inclusions. And the algebra we get at the end of the day when we take this union and the closure is a non unital C star algebra. Uh, okay, but you know, sometimes it's, it's nice to have units. And uh, we can, in fact, do a similar sort of procedure where the matrices fit not non-unitally one inside the other, but, but unitally. And then the algebra that we get at the end of the day will, will have a unit. So how do we put a matrix algebra, let's say like M2 just before into M4, but do it unitally? We can do it like this. So we send A not to A000, in other words, but A00A. A. We do this kind of doubling map. And this time, the identity two by two matrix does get sent to the four by four identity matrix, get sent to you know, one, 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 one. More generally, if we have some M dividing N, then we can do a similar thing. We send A to a bunch of copies of A down the diagonal, everything is zero, uh, so, you know, N over M copies of A down the diagonal. This will be a unital star homom, and you, you can check this is a star homomorphism uh, from one matrix to a bigger one that whose size is, is a multiple. All right, so uh, general fact, um, when do there exist unital star homomorphisms from one matrix to another? It's precisely when we are in this situation where M divides N. And in fact, this map of sending an, uh, a matrix A just down the diagonal a bunch of times is essentially all you can do. So it is a fact, a proposition that I'm, I'm telling you uh, that a unital star homomorphism from one matrix algebra to another exists precisely as I say when M divides N. And they are all of this form, bunch of A's down the diagonal, up to conjugation by some unitary. So a unitary matrix, remember, is, is one whose adjoint is its, its inverse. And, and you can check this. This is once again a star homomorphism, but that's all the freedom we have. So they all essentially look like this. In particular, what this tells us is that any two unital star homomorphisms from MM to MN are unitarily equivalent. So the only difference between them is some unitary conjugate. 
All right. So, by the way, um, and so now we can imagine we have a sequence like M2 sitting inside M4 doing this doubling map, and then M4 sitting inside M8. When I say sitting inside, I mean we have an injective star homomorphism from one to the other. And then we have an injective star homomorphism from M4 to M8, again, by doing the doubling map. Uh, but, but this is an important distinction to make between literally sitting inside one and the other and instead just having an, embe an embedding, an injective star homomorphism, which we view as uh, an embedding. Um, it, it's an important distinguish distinguishment to make uh, because in the case of the compact operators, it was kind of easy to see, like actually visually see, yeah, we just have this chain of subalgebras. We take the union and then we take the closure. It's, it's a little trickier to see uh, view M2 actually as a subalgebra of M4 and that actually as a subalgebra of M8 and then you know, sitting on side, inside some B of H and then taking the union and the closure. We can do it. Uh, there is a very nice way to do it using um, infinite tensor products. But instead of showing you that approach, I'm going to show you some abstract nonsense, sort of in keeping it with the theme of, of Monday's talk. I'm going to show you an abstract nonsense way of making sense of a kind of general notion of a union whenever we are in the situation where we have a bunch of c algebras and some maps between them. And we would like to somehow take the union given this, uh, this information. And the, uh, the abstract nonsense thing that does this is what's called an inductive limit. So let's say we are in this situation that I just described. We have a bunch of c algebras and we have a bunch of star homomorphisms between them. Uh, let's think of these star homomorphisms. Let's call them connecting map. So I can connect AI to AI plus one via some map phi I. And then I can connect AI, in fact, to any J that's bigger than or equal to I. So I can connect AI to itself just by doing the identity map. I can connect AI to a bigger AJ by just taking uh, composition of, of the this successive maps. The inductive limit of a system of Seaster algebras and homomorphisms like this is uh, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm telling you exists. And it's a Seaster algebra written like this. And it satisfies the following universal property, which I'll describe to you. But just you should think, again, this is just some abstract way of making sense of a union. Okay, so first of all, we have, so we have these, as I said, connecting maps from AI to any bigger AJ. What we also have are connecting maps from AI into this inductive limit. And these are compatible with the connecting maps between AIs and AJs in this sense. So if I start with an AI, I connect it to AJ, and then I map it to A, that's the same as doing just AI into A. All right, so these maps, which I'm denoting by phi I infinity from AI to A, make this diagram commute, All right? So th this is the, the, the first half of what I'm going to, the universal property I'm going to describe. It, by the way, so again, just thinking of this as like some union, what is the saying? It's saying if I include some subalgebra AI into a bigger one and then include the bigger one into A, that's just the same as including AI into A straight away. That's what this is mirroring, that phenomenon. Okay, and the universal property is this. So suppose that I have, another sister algebra B. And I have these maps from AIs into B. So like the phi I infinities, but let's call them psi I. So I have some psi I from A to B, some psi J from AJ to, uh, to, uh, to B. Um, and again, they are compatible in the sense that if I go from AI into AJ and then to B via psi J, that's the same as just going from AI into B directly. So if I have another such compatible system, then the universal property is that there is a unique star homomorphism from A into B, which I'm calling phi, that makes this diagram commute. And again, how, how should you think about this? So imagine that my subalgebras AI are living all in some big subalgebra uh, B. So think of these are the matrix algebras living inside some B of H. Then the union, the, the closure of the union of these subalgebras is kind of the, the smallest object containing the AI. So it also will sit in B. That's, that's what this is mirroring, right? But the, the, the take home message is that this is some sort of abstract nonsense. This, by the way, that's just what I wrote as what I just said. Um, so the take home message is that uh, an inductive limit is an abstract way of making sense of, of a union whenever we have this situation of sister algebras and, and connecting them. 
Uh, and in fact, it, it really is, um, we can make this abstract notion a bit more concrete. So if in fact these connecting maps are injected, and, and from what I'm going to, everything I'm gonna tell you about today, they will always be injective, then these maps uh, phi i infinity are also injective. So we can just identify AI with its image in A via these phi i infinity, and then this abstract inductive limit thing really just becomes an on the nose uh, increasing union with, with the closure, All right? But, Sorry, and push yeah. out of uh, sister algebras would be another example of such a limit. Uh, yes, yes, sure, yes. I mean, it's this, it's a funny thing that uh, inductive limit is actually what's called a pole limit in the in the in catalyst. Yeah. Uh, never mind that. Okay, so finally, here's the definition of a, of a, a UHF algebra. UHF stands for uniformly hyperfinite, and it is exactly a one of these inductive limits, so one of these abstract unions of a system where the sister algebras are just these uh, matrix algebras, so M and I for some NIs, and these phi I's are some uh, unital star homomorphisms. So of necessity, I remember the necessary condition for there being a unital star homomorphism is that these NIs should, should uh, successively be multiple of each other. Okay, so that's what a UHF algebra is. Here's an example. Uh, the so-called car algebra is what I was describing, the kind of analogy of the compact operators, except where we have unital maps all the time. So the, the building blocks are these, again, M2, M4, M8, M16, but instead of embedding one into the other, just in the, oh, 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 oh. Yeah, just in, in the top left corner, we do this kind of a doubling map all the time. Uh, by the way, the, why is it called the car algebra? Uh, C-A-R stands for canonical, anti-commutation relation. It, it's something that's important in uh, fermionic quantum mechanics, but never mind that. Just for us, this is what a car algebra is. It's just it, a, is, it, is it isomorphic to the infinite tensor products? Of, yes, of exactly. M2, yes. It is, and- so uh, Seeing a trace as a state with respect to, it, uh, with respect to which we take this infinite tensor product, yes? Yeah, absolutely. And in, in fact, we will see why a Caesar algebra is there isomorphic uh, shortly. So maybe also a quick remark. So. If we are taking infinite tensor product, this construction uh, depends from the choice of the state uh, we, uh, for which uh, we take this infinite tensor product and for different choices of states, uh, not being a trace, one usually gets something which on the level of von Neumann algebra gives you factors of type three, as far as I know, yes? Yeah. Those sure, exotic yeah. exotic factors. But I'm, yeah, that's, that's, that's... True, but I mean, I think there are ways of making sense of an infinite tensor product without even referring to, to states. And you can again just think about it as an inductive limit system. Uh, okay, probably in the context of the C star algebra, yes. yes but yes. in the context of von Neumann algebra, you need a star. Absolutely. Okay, yes, okay, absolutely. okay. Right. thank you. Okay, right. So now that we know what a UHF algebra is, I want to tell you about how to classify them, which will address the, the, the point that was just made, that these two different ways of viewing this car algebra, whatever it is, are in fact the, the same thing. And by, by classification, what I mean is this. I'm going to describe to you an invariant, which is called a supernatural number. And if two UHF algebras have the same supernatural number, then they will be isomorphic. This is what I mean by, by classification. So a supernatural number is something that uh, is described via the, the prime numbers. So let's list all the prime numbers. For each j, let's let pj be the jth prime number. So p1 is, is 2, p2 is 3, et cetera, et cetera. All right. So the supernatural, so let's suppose we have um, one of these UHF algebras, which we are viewing as uh, a, a increasing union when we're taking the closure. It is a formal product of prime powers where these exponents, these mj's, they can be any natural number, potentially also zero, but they can also be infinity. And how are they defined? So we look at, for each pj, we look at the highest power of pj that divides some ni. Let's illustrate with some examples. So if we take this car algebra, so this m2 infinity is what I'm denoting this sequence m2 sitting inside m4 sitting inside m8, okay? So the, the matrix sizes are just two to the i for every i, in other words. So what does that mean? That means we're getting arbitrarily large powers of two dividing these ni's. So this m 
for the prime associated to two. So M1, uh, in other words, would be infinite. But for all the other primes, they don't divide these numbers at all. So these MJs will just be zero. So the supernatural number will be two to the infinity, three to the zero, five to the zero, et cetera. So it's, it's just two to the infinity, right? So it, it's, it's a formal product. This is just a formal expression. Uh, similar example, if we look at M10 uh, to the infinity, so this just analogously means we have M10 setting aside M100, setting aside M1000 and so on. So now we have uh, the primes two and five dividing these numbers ni to arbitrarily i powers, but again, no other primes uh, appear. So the, the supernatural number is two to the infinity times five to the infinity. Um, third example, let's say we have a, a bit of a different uh, behavior. So we have what, what I mean by, by this is we have, okay, m2 setting inside m2 times three, setting inside m2 times three times five, setting inside m2 times three times five times seven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So each prime appears highest power just one. So this number mj for every single prime is exactly one. So in this case, the supernatural number is just this formal product of all the primes, two times three times five times seven, et cetera. Okay, so th this is what, what a supernatural number is. You give me any, and it just depends upon these numbers, ni, that appear in the way that you build up your UHF algebra. All right, so the, the theorem due to Glim, in 1960 is exactly what I, what I told you, that if we have two UHF algebras, which could you know, be described in different ways, uh, building up matrix algebras, um, if the supernatural numbers are the same, then the Seaster algebras are isomorphic. Um, so so this, this was proved by Glim in 1960 using ideas that go even further back to von Neumann in the, in the 1940s. Uh, yeah. May, may I interrupt you? Could you go back to the previous slide? Yep. So if you look at these products, you always get infinity. So do I understand correctly that you actually don't think about a single number, but rather numbers associated to each prime? Yeah, exactly. Sequence. Exactly. You think, exactly. It, it, I guess formally you would think of a supernatural number as, as a sequence. Okay. Thank a you. sequence in, in the in zero union and union infinity. By the way, you, you can get a finite number. Exactly. If and only if it's a finite matrix algebra. So if the union stops at some point, you will, you will get a, a finite number. Uh, all right. Um, okay. So I, I want to show you the, the proof of this is be, uh, because it's, it's not difficult and um, it illustrates some uh, important ideas that are still very useful today in C star algebra theory. So what we're going to show is that two C star algebras, A and B, two UHF algebras, with the same supernatural number must be isomorphic. We're going to show that they must be isomorphic to a common c star algebra, a UHF algebra C. We're going to build C as a kind of uh, canonical UHF algebra associated to this common supernatural number. So let's suppose we have uh, A, this is our, our UHF algebra. This is its supernatural number. So some, some formal product of, of prime powers and it's the same as uh, for B. Um, I'm going to build for you a UHF algebra C where the associated numbers are what I'm going to call Li. So it's going to be ML1 sitting inside ML2 sitting inside ML3, et cetera. And Li is defined uh, like this. All right, so it's a product from J to I of, of PJ to the minimum of I and MJ. All right, maybe it takes a minute or two to wrap your head around what this is saying. I think the best way is let's look at an example. So let's say we have a supernatural number P2 cubed, P3 to the infinity, uh, P4 squared and all of the rest is just zero. So let, let's just go through and see what these allies turn out to be. So L1 is the product from one to one, so it's, so it's one uh, thing. So it's P1 to the minimum of one and M1 is zero, okay? P1 doesn't appear, P1 to the zero. So this, is, this minimum is just zero. So L1 is P1 to the zero, so it's just one. By the way, so whenever one turns up as an index, mj will always be one, so this minimum will always be zero. Okay, so as far as one is concerned, it'll never appear. It'll, I'll just give me a zero term. Similarly for p5, uh, p6, p7, etc., those mj's will always just be zero, so this minimum will always just be zero. So I only really need to look at what happens to p2, p3, and, and p4, right? All of the other powers will just be one. Okay, so let, let's look at the next one. So P2 will be the product from J equals one to two. 
of, uh, of these numbers. As I said, the one we don't need to worry about. So let's look at the two. It'll be P2 to the minimum of I is two and M, uh, oh God, I'm a disaster. <laughs> oh no, rotates counterclockwise. Oh, thank you, all right. Okay, so uh, P2 will be the minimum of uh, two and, uh, oh my God. And M2 is uh, three. Okay, the minimum of two and three is, is two, all right? So L2 is P2 squared, and, and that's it. All right, let's look at L3. So L3 would be, okay, P1, we don't need to worry about. P2, this time will be the minimum of three, and M3 is three, so it's, it's three. So that's why we get P2 cubed. And uh, P3 would be the minimum of three, and M3 is infinity, so it's three. So L3 is P2 cubed, P3 cubed. Once more, L4, one, we don't need to worry about. Two, this time will be the minimum of four and three. Okay, so notice now from this point onwards, I will always be bigger than E equal to four as far as uh, three is concerned. So once we hit P2 cubed, which is exactly what's appearing here, it's going to stay that way forever onwards. Okay, so now we don't need to worry about the, the J equals two terms. So it's always now just going to be P2 cubed, P2 cubed, P2 cubed. As far as the... Uh, uh, where did, as far as the, the, the um, P3 terms is concerned, this time, so J is three here, we're looking at the minimum of four and infinity, so it's going to be four. So because M4 is in, M3 is infinity, what's, that'll always be the bigger one, so the minimum will be I. So as far as the P3 term is concerned, it's just going to be growing by one all the time, all right? And then the P4 term, lastly, uh, we have P4, to the minimum of four and two, which is two. So we get P4 squared. And now once we've hit the limit, we've reached P4 squared, it's going to stay put forever onwards. Okay, so what's happening here is that we're, we're really just choosing a canonical way for the prime powers to grow until they either hit the finite bound, or if the power is infinite, they're just gonna grow one by one by one by one, et cetera, et cetera. Right, so that, that's what's happening. It's just a, a canonical way of describing the growth of the primes that appear in the, in the numbers ni that are describing the supernatural number. All right, and then as I said, we, we build the UHF algebra associated to these numbers just by embedding ML1 into ML2 by this kind of diagonal star homomorphism that we've discussed. We just do this uh, consecutively. The, the crucial thing about these numbers li is that they have the following property. If you give me any I1, so I start with any Ni1, as long as I2 is large enough, remember how, how do these Ls behave? The prime powers are growing. So they either grow to the maximum finite power of the Pj or they grow arbitrarily large. So because of that, if as long as I take a big enough Li2, so an Li2 far enough along, I will have Ni1 dividing Li2. So either, I just look at need to do it prime by prime. So either the, fine, the, the prime PJ has a finite MJ, that means if I go far enough along, the Li2 will actually hit that value of MJ, or the MIJ is infinity, that means that the MJ is going bigger and bigger and bigger. So as long as I go far enough along, I'm going to have this number dividing this number. And that means I will have a unit of star homomorphism from N, M, N, I1 to M, L, I2. And in fact, the other way around is true for similar reasons. So if I start with any Li2, if I go far enough along, Li2 will divide Ni3. So I have a map from M Li2 to M Ni3. So what I'm going to do is just go back and forth like this. I'm going to go from the MNs down to the MLs, back up to the MNs, down to the MLs like this. And going back and forth like this, we'll construct what's called an intertwining diagram between the two sequences. So let me show you the, how, it, how it works diagrammatically. So on the top here, we have the sequence that's giving me the sequence of algebras that's giving me A as its union. Down below, I have the sequence of algebras that I just constructed giving me the C. So I start with some MN1. I know that by going far enough along the sequence, it doesn't have to be here, but for the sake of the picture, maybe it's down here, but for the sake of the picture, it's here. So I go from MN1 down into some MLI2. And then I know I can go back up. 
And then I know so, I can go back down. So, and then I know I can go back. So up. this argument is a reason for the title of your talk, yes? Ah, uh, hmm, not yet. <laughs> not yet. Not okay. yet. So you mean the drunkard spot? Yeah. No. So the the drunkard spot is going to refer to some randomness. There is no randomness here. Okay. There is maybe some freedom of choice because I can sort of choose how far along to go. But there's no randomness there. Yet. But this is an interesting point of view which I did not okay. consider. All right. So now we we have this kind of uh, going back and forth diagram. But now let's look at what situation we're in. From m n i one to m n three, this is a unital star homomorphism. But this composition is also a unital star homomorphism. But we said that there's essentially only one. The only difference between these two is conjugation by some unitary. Similarly, this. So the only difference between this and this is conjugation by some unitary, et cetera. So this diagram, each triangle commutes up to conjugation by some unitary. But then I can just take that unitary into account. So this map that I had going back up, I have some freedom there. It doesn't have to be the diagonal map. I can just twist it by this unitary that appears here. And then similarly, once I've adjusted this map, I can adjust this map and so on and so on and so on. So when I make all these adjustments, I get in fact an on the nose commutative diagram. And this on the nose commutative diagram induces a star homomorphism from the limit into C, which I'm calling alpha, and also one the other way around from C to A that I'm calling gamma. How does it work? If I want to know where to send something in here, I can just send it down and then include it down the limit. Why is this well-defined? Because maybe I, I choose, choose to view this as sitting in here by inclusion, and then I send it down and includes. I get the same thing because this square commutes. Okay, so I, I get a well-defined map from this union into this union and uh, the other one. S small detail, I am not just taking the union, but the closure. So I need to check that these uh, really do extend to the closure, but they do because star homomorphisms are automatically continued. So that's not a problem. And in fact, these two maps are inverse to each other because if I start with something here and I go down by alpha and then I go back up by gamma, what is this? This is again, just the, the inclusion. So one composed of the other is just the identity. That's the end of the proof. So, you said that uh, it is enough uh, for those maps to be bounded, but do you uh, maybe, maybe you also need the fact that the uh, they are uniformly bounded. Yes. That yes, yes. 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 Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. We, they they in fact all not just bounded but contracted, absolutely contracted. Yes. But but okay. But this is the end of the proof. We've constructed an isomorphism between A and C. Similarly, there's one from B to C, so there's one from A to B. Um, and sorry, the fact that those maps are uh, mutually inverse isomorphisms follows from the purely uh, categorical definition of inductive limit, yes? Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, sure. But the composition yeah. is yes. a good map for if, if you would consider the same diagram with A instead of C, yes? So, yeah. so the yeah. composition must be identical. Yes? It's true, yeah, okay. absolutely. After yes, including yes. those unitaries. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah. Okay, so but one thing I, I didn't show you in the proof is that the supernatural number, it really is an isomorphism invariant. So in other words, we, we should know that if two UHF algebras are isomorphic, then they do have the supernatural number. So in other words, Glimp's theorem is an if and only if. So two C, the UHF algebras are isomorphic if and only if they have the same supernatural number. It's possible to uh, show this in elementary ways, but a kind of abstract nonsense way to do it is using K-theory. So K0 is a functor from the category of C-star algebras to the category of abelian groups. Um, you can think of it like this. It's the abelian K0 of a C-star algebra A is the abelian group generated by isomorphism classes of finitely generated projective A modules, if that means something to you. If A is the complex numbers, a finitely generated projective A module is just a finite vector space. And the isomorphism class of a finite vector space is just described by a number, the dimension. So this is K0 of the complex numbers is the abelian ge group generated by the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. So it's, it's the integers. Okay, so I've, I've just proven to you that K0 of C is, is dead. Um, and K0, because it's a functor, it sends isomorphisms to isomorphism. So if two C-star algebras are isomorphic, then the K0 groups are isomorphic. And the supernatural number is something that can be read off from the K0 group of UHF algebra. Uh, it's, it's analogous to what, what Tomasz was uh, describing on Monday, that the genus can be read off from the homology groups of, uh, of, of surfaces. 
okay, as I said, you can show this supernatural number being an isomorphism invariant in elementary ways, but I, I wanted to uh, mention this, this K0 just to describe to you this uh, classification theorem for sister algebras of which Klim's theorem is a very special case. So the theorem is, there is a functor called the Elliott invariant. It has its origins in K-theory. It classifies uh, a bunch of adjectives of sister algebra, simple, separable, unitary, infinite dimensional, finite nuclear dimension, and satisfy this universal coefficient theorem. It classifies in this sense. If the Elliott invariants are isomorphic, then the algebras are isomorphic. Um, so uh, two of the, the, the recurring themes in this, uh, this week have been non-commutativity and classification. And this really captures both of them. I'm not going to go through for time reasons what, I mean, for more than time reasons, what all of these adjectives mean. But for example, finite nuclear dimension is a non-commutative notion of the topological dimension of a, uh, of a, of a topological space. Okay, anyway, so this is... Um, it just, just to mention you that that Klim's theorem was kind of the, the prototypical example of, of this very general classification that holds today. All right, so finally, let's get to the, the, the drunkards part of the, the title. So I'm going to show you how to randomly construct these UHF algebras. So the, the, the kind of research problem that I'm interested in lately is uh, randomly building algebras. You build a, uh, an algebra in some random way, and then you try to see how likely you are to get certain structures in, in your algebra. And one of the things that uh, makes this, this crazy dream of mine uh, possible is when you have some kind of classification by a structure that looks more combinatorial than algebraic. Because then well, what can we do? We just, so a combinatorial structure like, uh, like a simplex or a, a, the co-kernel of an integer matrix or, or a supernatural number then we can just randomly construct this kind of combinatorial structure, which is easier to make sense of. And then we pinpoint the Z algebra that has this uh, classifying structure as its invariant. And this will give us a way of randomly constructing the algebra. And we're going to randomly build, so what we'll randomly build a supernatural number, and this will allow us to random interpret this as a random UHF algebra. We're going to do this by, by a drunk, what's called a drunkard's walk. Okay, so the situation is this. We have a semi-infinite street. So at zero, we have this drunkard. Her home is at zero. And she, at, at, at position I, there is a city block on the street. And she's stumbling back and forth from block to block. So if she's at position I, then she stumbles to the right with probability P, or she stumbles to the left with probability Q, which is one minus P. This is what's called a, a, a simple random walk. So we start somewhere with some initial distribution like this. For example, the, the geometric distribution that was mentioned in one of the talks on Monday and to her position uh, from at time n plus one, given her position at n, is just given by, by, by this, what, what, I, what I just described. All right, so this describes what happens kind of uh, in the middle of, of the street, but we need to decide what happens if she gets home. If she reaches zero, what happens? And there, there are two possibilities. So if she reaches zero, maybe you know she, her, her roommate can persuade her, look, you've had enough, go to bed, go to sleep. So she gets to zero. And, and this, this argument of the roommate works with some probability Q. So if she gets to the front door, then with probability Q, she can be persuaded to, to go to sleep. Um, otherwise, with probability P, she, she goes back out. You know, and similarly, so as I said, if she's at position two, with probability P, she goes to the right, probability Q to the left. It's, by the way, the way this problem is usually phrased is we have the home at zero, and we have the bar at some position k. If she makes it to the bar, she'll never leave. If she makes it home, she'll never leave. The question is, well, well, which does she get to first? What's the probability that she eventually goes to sleep? Except in this scenario, the bar is out at infinity. So she's never going to get to the bar. It's always going to be a fruitless pursuit. Okay, so that's case one of what can happen. Case two is that Whatever happens, whatever her roommate says, doesn't matter. She refuses to go inside. With probability one, if she gets to a front door, she just immediately goes back out. Probability one. Um, so in the first case, the walk that she takes contaminates. So there is some probability. It, it can happen that she is persuaded eventually to go to bed. In the, in the second case, never is a finite walk. She always just goes back out in fruitless search of this bar that happens to be at infinity. All right, so using this, we are going to uh, build our random supernatural number just by keeping track of her position 
from point to point. So again, let's take a, uh, some enumer enumeration of the primes. Let's write P0 and P minus one to be one uh, for to take into account the positions at zero and minus one. And we're going to build the random supernatural number. It's just P Y zero. So maybe she starts at position five. So the first component of this supernatural number would be P five. Then if she moves to six, the next will be, we multiply P five by P six and so on and so on and so on. So we build a supernatural number and then we just ask, okay, well, which UHF algebra do we get with what probability? Uh, this is a, a very classical situation. I mean, this was analyzed, for example, in work of uh, Carlin and McGregor in the 50s. Um, the same Carlin, by the way, who was mentioned on Monday, Carlin's occupancy scheme, uh, and who is Polish, by the way. Um, so, okay, so the, the theorem is this. And this is just some classical probability that I'm interpreting via constructions of UHF algebras. So in case one, this is where she can, um, her walk can terminate. The termination of the walk means that the supernatural number she constructs is actually just a finite product of primes. So what she ends up with is a finite matrix algebra. And there are two possibilities. So either P is less than or equal to Q. This means that she's more likely to head towards home than to wander out. So in that case, with probability one, her walk will terminate. And the UHF algebra she constructs is just a finite matrix algebra. On the other hand, if P is bigger than Q, so she's more likely to wander off than to head home, then the, the probability of eventually going to bed is smaller. And it's given by this expression. So what this is saying is that if she starts her position at I, she starts at I, then the probability of eventually going to bed is Q over P to the probability of I plus one. All right, so the, the probability that we end up with a, a, a finite matrix algebra in this case is, is this summation. The summation is just to account for the possibility, the, the initial distribution. We, she may start at different points with different probabilities. And in case two, so this time she cannot construct a finite matrix algebra. It's an always an infinite walk, so she always is building an infinite product of, of, of primes. Um, so two things can happen. Uh, so first of all, again, if she's in the situation where she's more likely to wander off, what will happen is that with probability one, every position is what's called transient. So with probability one, she will make at most finitely many visits to every block. So her tendency is to wander off to infinity. So with probability one, we will be building a supernatural number where each of these MJs will just be finite. We never get infinity. So we get what's called a UHF algebra finite type in this scenario. On the other hand, if we're in this situation where she's more likely to head home, then with probability one, each of these blocks is what's called recurrent. With probability one, each is visited infinitely many times. So each of these MJs will be infinity. So the supernatural number she constructs with probability one is P2 to the infinity times P3, P1 to infinity times P2 to the infinity, P3 to the infinity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by the way, so, so this kind of simple scenario I described, just a, a random walk on a line, um, it's a very special case of what's called an irreducible Markov chain. Markov chain is this phenomenon where the movement from time n to time n plus one only depends on her current position, not on anything she's done in the past, just where she is now. Irreducible means for any two positions, i and j, let's say she starts at i, there is some non-zero probability of getting from i to j. And it's a fact about irreducible Markov chains that either every state is recurrent, so with probability one visited infinitely many times, or every state is transient, probability one visited at most finitely many times. Um, so we could think, maybe we didn't list the primes on a line, maybe we put them in a grid. So she's wandering not just on the street, but across a whole city. And maybe she does a symmetric random walk. So the probability of going from one block to any of the four neighboring blocks is just a quarter. So in this case, we would still get a uh, recurrent random walk. So with probability one, she would once again visit all of the primes infinitely often. So this, the UHF algebra that has this as its supernatural number, it's a very important one in c algebra. It's called the universal UHF algebra. It has a property, probability, the property that every other UHF algebra embeds into it. 
uh, but because of this this uh, framework that I'm describing to you, um, I, I personally like to think about it as the drunkard's UHF algebra. So this is the explanation of the name of the type. All right, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, questions, please. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about operations on uh, sister algebras. You were telling them uh, on uh, defining the inductive limit of those algebras yeah. uh, before uh, telling the main definition. And there were some digressions and comments about different types of operations taken from uh, category theory on those uh, sister algebras. And uh, the comments were really quick, and I ah. didn't uh, catch the essence uh, of those comments. I remember there was a mentioned word uh, push out, and it was said that it's something different than uh, those limits, but I didn't, uh, didn't catch what was important here. And I would like to ask uh, what was important. So, okay, maybe I, maybe I differed. Uh, I, I see. <laughs> so, uh, from from my my point of view, what's the important thing to distinguish here, which is a bit confusing, is that categorically, what I've described as an inductive limit is what's called a co-limit. There is dually a notion of a projective limit, uh, where it's it's just a a system where the arrows kind of go the the other way, basically. Projective limits are more important in, in a topological setting. But remember, there was this, there's this gelfand Neimark theorem, which says that the category of commutative uh, of, of compact Hausdorff spaces is equivalent to the category of commutative sister algebras. But it is an anti-equivalent, meaning that uh, it's a, you get a contravariant functor. So arrows get flipped. So this limit, uh, the, this uh, projective limit in the category of topological spaces becomes a, an, a, a limit, an inductive limit in the category of, of C star algebras and, and the other way around. So co-limits become limits, sort of. From, this is just something to, to bear in mind, I think, more generally, that things get flipped from topology to C star algebras. I think the arrows go the, the other way around. Pushouts in the context of topological spaces become pullbacks in the context of, of C star algebras. I, I think this is the essence of, of what we'll see. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah I got a question. Uh, when you say that supernatural numbers are equal, do you mean that 2 to the power infinity and 5 to the power infinity are the same numbers or they are different in your context? Different numbers. So formally, I guess what you would say is it's a supernatural number is a sequence of um, a, so a, a sequence indexed by the primes. And you, you want the sequences to be to be different. All right. And one more question: Why uh, is Drancourt she? Ah, I mean, no. Okay. The, the real the real reason is uh, when I when I wrote I, I wrote a paper of, of that this appeared in, and in my I wrote a paper on the archive. In the archive, I was imagining that there was this professor called Taiki, Taiki, the the Greek goddess of fortune. This is why. So, so Taiki was doing all of these things, like taking a drunken walk and, and, and stuff like this. Yeah. So I, I, I must say that, sorry, this, this version of the paper where I have Taiki doing all these things that were very amusing to me, the, the journal was less amused <laughs> by this. So there, she's, Taiki got removed from the actual journal paper, but if you look on the archive, you, you will see the origins of this, uh, this, this she. Yeah. Excellent question. Anybody else? May I ask uh, just to maybe get get the idea what can be this inductive limit of uh, matrix algebra? So yeah. you mentioned that for uh, the powers of two, uh, those are all compact operators, and uh, for different sequences, uh, can one expect some properties or and uh, are there always compact uh, so some uh, some sub spaces of compact operators? Yeah. So. For, as if you do it just in a way where one sits in the top left corner of the other, you will always get the compact operators as long as it grows to infinity. It doesn't matter. You, you can take two and four and eight, um, eight 
just as a, it's a, a sort of nice aesthetic choice, but you could just equally well take M2 sitting inside M3, sitting inside M4 in M5 and M6, again, just in the top left corner. This will still give you the compact operators. It, it's, it's not uh, a contradiction to this statement about UHF algebras because UHF algebras, remember, it has to be unital. These have to be unital uh, embeddings. So that, that, that's the, the difference there. Um, so yeah, whether you can... UHFs are not in compact operators. Yeah, this is, this is something to bear, to, to bear in mind. Compact operators, you get something non-unital, UHF also. You should think about compact operators just as the closure of all these finite rank operators. That's it. Yeah, by the way, why is it called compact operators? It's, it's because um, an equivalent, so there are different ways of defining the compact operators. One is, as I described it, this increasing disclosure of increasing unions with matrix algebra. The second way, a linear operator is compact precisely when it can be approximated by operators that are of finite rank, of finite range, finite dimensional range. Third way is that the image of the unit ball of the Hilbert space or the closure of the image should be compact. It's a compact set. Um, this, this is quite a uh, restrictive property. This is automatic in finite dimensions, but very much not in infinite dimensions. So the, the unit ball of a, uh, an infinite dimensional Hilbert space is not a compact set. Uh, so that's why, for example, the identity operator is not a compact operator. So that's why the compacts are not units. And by the way, just to straighten it out, the pushout is a special case of this limit, not that it's something different, it's just a special case where this diagram of compatible arrows is very simple. And, and they don't have to be injected. Ah, this is, but this is also something to bear in mind. I mean, I, I kind of made the point that this, this enough to limit is just kind of really just a, a union. But it makes sense even when the connecting maps are not injective. And that's important. And then it, it's not maybe quite the same as just thinking about it as a union. It, it's kind of the, the right abstract notion for encapsulating this phenomenon. How difficult is it to prove that this inductive limit exists in the category of system algebras? Not difficult at all. I mean, it can be described very concretely. This this construct. Yeah, construct. Okay. Mm -hmm. not, not difficult. And this is like a sub-construction, right? It's a sub-algebra. Yeah. In some product. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Any further questions from the room? How about Zoom? Well, my Zoom went to sleep. Okay. I don't see any raised hands. So let us thank Bishan again for his extremely beautiful talk. Thank you. So now let's have some whiskey. I'm sorry, coffee. And, uh, and then we resume at uh, 1130. Fantastic.